Hi guys, welcome back. I'm top music attorney, Miss Crystal, and this is the Top Music Attorney Podcast, the place where you learn how to master the entertainment business, learn how to stay legally protected, and we're doing that every Tuesday and Friday at 7 p.m. PST right here on Top Music Attorney YouTube. We are live and we're broadcasting right now on YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn and all the places so that you guys can not only join in the conversation, particularly when we get to the artist tip segment, our newsy things segment, um, but also just to check in. So our first portion of the show is just to check in. As you guys are filing in, we're going to have our tea. I ended up um, purchasing a bunch of different like throat coat teas. <laughs> So as, as you guys uh, may know, I am working very hard to kind of get my voice to a place that I need it to be as far as strength. I'm talking all day. I'm having client meetings and Zoom calls and, and, and phone calls. And then, of course, we do our show during the week. And now I'm recording my album. And so I need to be in tip-top shape because I'm always recording at the end of the day after I've been talking all day long. So now we have you know, throat lozenges and tea and all kinds of things happening. Hello, hello. Happy Friday. We're going now into the weekend. I know everyone has some crazy plans, right? Drop a comment in the chat. Let me know where you're checking in and what your plans are this weekend. <laughs> I am, um, you know, we're probably going to be continuing to record. And for those of you who are, you know, music producers, artists, singers, musicians, you know, the kind of struggle of recording sometimes, you know, as far as getting the right takes or, you know, even just kind of scheduling stuff, you know, there's all kinds of things that come up, but we kind of switched gears yesterday. I was talking to my music and show producer, that Orca, who will be on with us later tonight. Um, but I was talking to him and I go, I just want to switch things up. I want to do completely different for how we're recording because we have a vocal booth, like a DIY vocal booth that we built and it's cool. Like it's, you know, kind of sound proofed and we have, you know, LED lights all around the top. If you guys ever see my stories, I'm like posting whenever we're recording. And um, in any case, we've been doing that for a couple of years now. And I just said, you know what? I just kind of want to try a different, like when we demo songs, it's so casual. I'm sitting, I'm like in the middle of the room. There's no sound guards anywhere. It's like super sloppy, but I feel like when we do the demos, you get something so organic. So we tried doing it that way last night for one of the songs off of the upcoming album, and it went so good. And I was obsessively listening to what we recorded this morning as I was driving to work, and I just, ugh, when you get the feels, it's a good thing. So yes, new album in the works. I'm very happy. Hello, everyone. All right, we have, we have Italy. Very nice. AR on June 1, I just had a from New York City set, but going to keep pushing it. Are you saying you just released something? Corvin, cello forever. You guys know I play cello. It's not something that I feature as much. I don't really show you guys me playing my cello or piano or any of that too much, but it, that's going to change. We're going to be getting into it now. Obviously, this is the top music attorney podcast. And so this is where we talk about all the newsy things. We're learning how to stay legally protected. And that's really my passion um, and kind of why, you know, I started this show. So, you know, I've been really happy because as we're now doing this two times a week, Tuesdays and Fridays, 7 p.m. PST, we're doing it very consistently. And so the whole point is to kind of, you know, build our community here. I really, really want to continue connecting with you guys. You make this show so fun for me. I love being able to kind of go through the news stories in particular, but having your guys' kind of feedback as we go through it all is really, really cool. Sean on Facebook, sorry, but it's all about the base. <laughs> Thomas checking in. There we go. Actually, I didn't know. I always use cello for chat. Hello. Okay, very nice. My friend plays cello, beautiful instrument, little side story. So um, I actually got into cello, I guess, by mistake. So um, when I was growing up, the first instrument that I earned or learned was piano. And then my mom got me into violin. 
And whenever I was practicing, she would come in, right? Because obviously, you, you know, play violin like this. And I would turn my violin upside down, right? So I'd play like a little mini cello, which I got into trouble for. Okay, I got, I got spanked. Uh, I wasn't supposed to be doing that. But she, you know, realized at some point that I wanted to actually play cello. So she got me a cello and I love it. I think cello is one of the instruments that's closest to the human voice in resonance, um, tone, feel. And so cello is, you know, definitely a very special instrument to me. And um, I love playing it. I just don't get to play very much or not as much as I want to. All right, let's go back to the chat. And then why don't we just go ahead? Let's get back. I'm, I'm going to look at your messages while we're doing this, but let's get right into the show. We have a ton to go through today, so let's get right into it. Hi, guys. I'm top music attorney, Miss Crystal. I'm an entertainment attorney, public speaker, and creator of the Top Music Attorney School for Artists and Record Labels. I'm the owner of Dukes Up Records, and most importantly, I'm an independent artist. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on those bell notifications so you don't miss my weekly videos giving you my best tips on the music business, industry news updates, and teaching you how to stay legally protected. I have a message from my uh, my producer. He's like, I have a picture of you in your cello. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a little something, and then if he finds the picture, we'll pull it up in just a second. Um, so I noticed that Camille Vasquez, she's in the news yet again. And um, if you guys don't recall, Camille was part of Johnny Depp's uh, team, his legal team, as part of his defamation lawsuit suit against ex-wife Amber Heard. Um, we've covered that at length on this channel. But I suppose uh, what happened, this elderly man, they were on a flight, and I think it was um, from Los Angeles to New York. And so this elderly man was suffering this medical emergency, and uh, I guess Camille responded. She had her private security with her, and so they responded and were assisting this gentleman until, you know, medical care could arrive. And so she's being kind of like, you know, noted in this heroic fashion, which I just love. I know that a lot of people, especially young women, um, are looking up to her, obviously, for the great performance. She got this huge promotion. She's a partner now um, from an associate to a partner in her law firm. So I thought that was that was pretty cool. OK, let's see. Do we have the picture? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to let you control this. You guys want to see this? <laughs> All right, there we go. So um, that picture is actually a behind the scenes when we were shooting my music video. I don't cry. So in I don't cry music video, you see me playing the piano. I'm playing the cello. And then um, you can see it a little bit in this picture, but I have some body paint. So this was um, I did body paint twice in, in college. And the um, the artist who did it, very, very talented, and he did this beautiful job. But they're like, red roses. You'll see there's red roses everywhere. Um, and then there's red roses painted on me as well. So really beautiful uh, picture. Nice job, every everyone on the team. And still one of my favorite songs. So thought I'd just kind of shout that out. Yeah, thank you, thank you. All right, hello. We still have everyone um, filing in. Do I do voiceover? I do voiceover for my stuff when I need to, right? When we need to have some kind of like audio only commercial or something, but no, not as like a professional gig. Now, um, for Dua Lipa fans, I thought I would also mention this, right? So on one of our last shows, we were covering the fact that she was getting sued over her levitating song. We talked a little bit about the lawyer that had been retained to represent her and that it was the same attorney for Katy Perry, right, on that successful appeal for her Dark Horse song. So we got into all that. That's on a prior show if you want to check it out. But I guess Dua Lipa is now getting sued. And this is actually the second time as it relates to a paparazzi photo that she posted on her socials, specifically Instagram. Now, I kind of want to put this to the community. I'm going I'm to put it out to the chat because I want your guys' opinion on this. All right. So we've talked about when musicians, artists, famous people post or repost pictures taken by paparazzi. If they don't have permission from the photographer, right, then it could be considered copyright infringement because there wasn't consent. And so we see a lot of these lawsuits popping up as what sometimes we'll call like ambulance chasers, right? Because you have automatically or automatic statutory penalties, right? So they'll be able to seek, you know, monetary damages for just reposting the picture. 
and it's big bucks, right? So we can have claims upwards of $150,000 per time it was posted. Oh no, we have a friend who just came in. Here, you guys wanna see friend? Come here. <laughs> yeah. This is Ripley. <laughs> this is where your super chats. Hi, baby. Hey, baby. <laughs> Thank you. The cats break in every once in a while as we're trying to do this. <laughs> so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let the show producer deal with the cats as we're going through here. This is Gizmo. <laughs> All right, what, what, what? No, that's the case when it comes to, um, you know, reposting uh, pictures. If you don't have consent, then you expose yourself to potential copyright infringement. It can be up to $150,000 if it's willful. So Dua Lipa reposted a paparazzi photo of herself. And then the photographer is Robert Barbara. Okay, so Barbara is seeking damages penalties, saying that, um, you know, by posting the photo to Instagram, you know, uh, to promote herself, right? Uh, her music, her business, all the stuff that I've been incredibly damaged, court, give me, you know, whatever, whatever amounts are due and owing. Now, the thing that kind of stood out to me is that this particular photographer has done this a number of times as far as uh, similar lawsuits, right? The photographer has filed lawsuits against pop stars like Ariana Grande, Justin Bieber, um, actually Grande twice <laughs> and settled out, you know, some of those cases. So the point is that it's almost like this is a part of business now for photographers. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Okay. There's a part of it that does maybe not feel so great. You know, when you're going to go after someone who was just excited about the photo and maybe didn't understand copyright law, but you know, we see this also with publishers, right? So publishers who are going after, um, you know, content creators who use songs, right, without permission, um, or record labels. And so now they have like whole teams dedicated to just pursuing potential claims. So I don't know, I just wanted to touch on it again for you guys, you, uh, you know, content creators, influencers, artists, just to know that if you are reposting pictures, make sure you have permission. <laughs> don't expose yourself to lawsuits. All right, Brenda on YouTube, I think that for millionaires like Dua Lipa or Ana Grande probably know about it, but they know they can afford to do it. Interesting, interesting uh, perspective, especially after you've been sued on that same issue. I think that's a good point, right? So if you've already been sued on the issue, you should know about it at this point. And then if you continue to do it, maybe you're just doing it because it's okay. If you get sued, then who needs a half a million dollars? Let's just pay it out. Kurt on Facebook, tomorrow's Michael Jackson tribute day because tomorrow's 13 years since he passed. Kurt, um, you know, interestingly enough, I was speaking with someone today and he, um, you know, shot a music video for Michael Jackson back in the day. And so we were just having a conversation about this and um, it's just so crazy, you know, as far as um, the clients that I work with and the experiences that they have had just being in the industry for as many decades as some of them have and just like how incredible that would have been obviously to like be the person shooting a music video for Michael, but thank you for sharing. Sean on Facebook, Bieber probably deserved it. <laughs> we talked about Bieber, man, poor Bieber having that facial paralysis. I don't know if it's, it's started to kind of clear or what's going on there, but we covered that um, a couple shows ago. Permission is paramount. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we're going to move in to, um, you know, just something to recap, right? So on, on our Tuesday show, I established the new ground rules of how we're going to do this for my something I tried this week to be superhuman, right? Because I think I was like updating with something every show, which you know, didn't give us enough time to really talk about it. So on this week, I had said, I'm already kind of into it. I want to kind of push past comfort boundaries. And so if we know that the you know far majority of people operate at a less than 50% capacity, right? So we're not really pushing ourselves. We're not really reaching our potential in all aspects, right? Family, love, life, career. And so the challenge was, and I don't know how many of you actually joined in with me on this, but the challenge was to push at least 5% harder on everything that you did this week, especially when you felt resistance, okay? 
um, and and just to kind of go to that next level. So for me, where that came into play was when I went to the gym, I went a little bit heavier on weights and kind of surprised myself. I'm like, damn, I'm like Hulk over here. I'm not Hulk yet, but we're working towards that. Um, you know, I pushed my voice. That's another thing because I'm really, you know, I've been struggling a little bit, but I'm pushing to kind of get to this next level of just getting past some fatigue and other issues. Um, and then I think the most important piece of this is I became aware of my hesitations. So I wanted to share this one as just the, the big recap and follow up is that I think just by really trying to be aware of my discomforts and those moments where maybe I got nervous or I hesitated that I just acknowledged it. And then I kind of just talked to myself and be like, whoa, you know, I just hesitated saying something to someone, right? Where I had that instinct. And then for that split second, I'm like, mm, not going to say it for whatever reason. I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want to embarrass myself. And so trying to catch it and then the next time being like, no, we're going to do it. No, we're going to do it. And so by kind of having that split section uh, decision making of we're going to push through the discomforts, I definitely pushed a little bit this week. I feel I feel like, I, you know, I'm going to keep doing this. And maybe by next week, you know, who knows? So, yes, I don't know who tried this with me, but. Um, Sean, I'm at about five percent. Except in the gym, I have zero ambition. My brain is Abby normal. That's fair enough. You know, I think like with ambition and motivation, we're like, I'm just going to wait for the stars to align and then I'm going to take action on my career. And the thing is, the stars are never going to align. Or even if they do, it's a caffeine high that you're going to experience for 10 minutes and then it's going to be gone. And so, you know, you have to kind of just um, take it completely out of the equation. Stop waiting to feel a certain way right? Make a to-do list, action items, fucking do it. And then do it a day after that. And then do it for a week solid. And just you'll show yourself and you'll prove to yourself that resiliency that you can actually do this. So that is my uh, two cents on that. All right, let's go back here in the chat. Brenda tried something new this week. Meal prepping now. Meal prepping is actually really hard. I keep trying to do this. I'm I'm at like a day ahead. I meal prep, but I really need to do like multiple days. It's just not working out. Philly, not music related and just ignore if not appropriate. Oh, that's always a good lead in. But any thoughts on the Supreme Court? Oh, we had that big decision today. Yeah, we're, we're not going to get into that on this show. I want to make sure that we kind of stay focused in for you guys as far as, you know, education. And uh, that one's a little bit more on the political side, but I appreciate the comment. All right. So now let's kind of transition in. We will you know, follow up on Tuesday with the next kind of crazy thing that I'm trying because it just seems to always be something. So in today's artist tip video, I'm going to teach you how to terminate your record label contract. All right. So as a real entertainment attorney, you guys contact my law office and this is a highly requested matter for clients, rights, And, you know, it usually expands beyond just record label contracts. So some of the things I'm going to discuss in this video are applicable to other contracts, but I'm really honing in specifically on record label contracts. And, you know, I know the ins and outs of these contracts. Okay. I am my bread and butter every day is that I'm working with artists. I'm helping to protect artists, but I'm also working with artists who start their own record labels. Right. So I know both sides of how these things work. And more importantly for you guys, how you can kind of think like a pro, think like an attorney and strategize the best way to get out of the contract if need be, okay? So number one, we're going to look at the term in the contract, okay? So you're gonna wanna actually, you know, open up your contract and it's usually one of the first sections in your contract, right? So, you know, us attorneys will refer to like a section, a paragraph as a provision, right? Or a clause, but those words essentially mean the same thing, right? So for the context of this video, I might say provision, for example, and I'm really just talking about, look at the section that starts with the word term. All right, so we're looking for, you know, the section on the term, and we're going to look at how long is the contract supposed to go for, right? Because obviously an easy way to look at this is, you know, when can we just naturally get out of the contract? When's it just going to be done? Okay, so look at natural expiration. And for the far majority of you, you're going to see that, well, the initial term might be, you know, one album, no less than 10 songs, uh, which cycle commences upon the commercial release of the album. Okay? And you're like, wow, that is kind of confusing. But when your album comes out, that starts the term. 
And so just count 12 months from there. So that's your first term, you know, and then you are done, except that a lot of record labels have what are called options. Options are options to extend the contract for additional albums. And, you know, for a lot of record labels, you know, unfortunately for artists, the artist uh, doesn't understand that it's important to negotiate that down to as few as possible. So, you know, I've seen uh, record label contracts where there's like six options, which means, you know, the total agreement is for seven albums. For the average artist, if you're pumping out, you know, one album a year, that means that's a seven year contract. But in any case, so take a look at the term and then see if, um, you know, there's an option that is guaranteed to the record label. And then has the record label exercise that option, okay? You want to look for language where it says if the record label after that term expires has not exercised the option, then artist has an obligation to email record label, right? Send some kind of written communication saying, hey, label, you didn't exercise your option. I, the artist, want to terminate, okay? And then that usually gives the label another opportunity to be like, oh, actually, we changed our mind. We do want to exercise but it's a step that the artist has to take. Okay, so in order to get the contract terminated and to try doing it this way, you gotta send a written notice and that notice might be via email, you know, look in the contract. It usually there'll be another section or provision that says notices. And it will say, if you're gonna send a notice, you have to send it by US mail and email. Reading the contract is very important, guys. All right, so that's the first piece. And let me really fast go back to this on the comments. I'm assuming actually here over here, uh, Sean, Facebook, I assume that's why Weezer needs dropping albums several a year. Yeah. You know, if, if, you know, an artist can kind of crank them out quickly and get them to the label and the label distributes them, then you can move through those options a lot faster. But sometimes, you know, there's issues on the, you know, end of the artist or the producer or even the label just being like, we're not ready to release your next album. We want to wait six months to kind of go through the marketing cycle. Um, so good, good, good point there. All right. So after you've kind of looked at the, um, the term, the options, then you're going to go to the section on termination. So there should specifically be a section that says termination. So now let's look at what are our rights to get out of the agreement? All right, so the first piece of this is that the label can terminate usually at any time with written notice. And, you know, the labels have a tendency to kind of keep it open-ended because if you're like a problem artist and they don't want to work with you, they want to have the ability to kind of send you off on your merry way. But the artist typically does not have kind of this unilateral right to just terminate, which is not good for the artist, right? So we look at the termination provision and we say, is there any right for the artist to terminate? And if not, then what we do is we look at, has there been any material breaches? Has the record label done anything that we can say, record label, you promised to do X, Y, and Z via the contract. You didn't. And so I'm now, you know, hiring the fiery attorney to come after you to slay and to get me out of this contract. But as far as making that determination, you're the artist, you're in the agreement, and you should know by actually reading the contract. So one of the big ones that I find um, labels have a tendency to not do is to comply with accounting provisions, right? So let's say record label promises to provide, you know, quarterly accounting. And they'll be like, all right, artist, has the label provided you in no less than, you know, four statements in a year or this year? And oftentimes the artist is like, no, I haven't received a statement ever. <laughs> so, um, you know, look at basically all the things that the record label promised to do. And if you find that there are things that the label never did, that may be a material breach and that may be a basis to terminate the contract. Now, obviously at this point, and once you actually find some kind of issue, this is a good point to actually talk to an entertainment attorney and make sure that that person can walk you through this because then, you know, you might want to send a termination notice and be like, hey, for all these reasons, you're in breach of the agreement and adios, but we're not done. So we've now looked at the termination provision, determined if any rights have been kind of violated or contract terms breached. And then we're going to go through, of course, the entirety of the contract in review of all the terms. Have all the terms been honored by the record label? Have there been any material breaches? And even if the record label did fail to send you accounting for like a year, are they doing it now, right? So is there an argument that that material breach has been cured? All right, so 
as a final kind of ditch effort. So let's say you've gone through the gambit. You've looked at the contract and you've determined that you don't think that there's a material breach. It doesn't look like you're going to be able to get out of the contract. The label still has options to renew. Then what I do is I actually just have kind of a conversation with the label and I say, okay, label, what's it going to take to get out of this? And sometimes there might be a discussion as far as a buyout, right? So we can look at um, what does the label want to release that artist from the contract? Um, what kind of carrots can we offer to get the artist out of the contract? But one kind of Hail Mary that has worked, and this is possibly the best information you guys will ever hear in your musical careers, is if the record label is a legal entity, right? So, and it probably is in most cases, right? So it's record label, you know, bombshell pink LLC. And they say that they are doing business in Texas. Do a search and find secretary of state for that state and look up the label. See if it's a real label, because if it's not a real label and they never actually registered to form a company, that could be a basis for you to say this contract is actually void. OK, so if the contract if, or if we have an argument that the contract is void, then you potentially can say I was never bound to this contract and see ya. And again, you call me up, we write an angry letter and we say uh, adios. So um, if you guys have any additional questions, make sure you drop some comments down below. But that's my overview on how to terminate your record label contract. All right, we have a good morning. Well, good morning. It is uh, evening here, but good morning indeed. Craig, sorry, if you're slow. Congratulations on pushing yourself harder. Thank you. You did also. Love that. Um, if you guys are, you know, artists and you are needing help, of course, make sure you check out how to keep your dukes up in the music business. You know, obviously, I'm all about just making sure to teach you how to stay legally protected, giving you the contracts that you need. Those all come for free with the book, and you can get those on topmusicattorney.com. All right. And if you guys want to get in touch, well, Kevin, you know, a great way is obviously just through, uh, you know, being here and being subscribed on Top Music Attorney. But if you are looking for the, uh, that additional legal help, um, we are pretty slammed with the law firm, but we do have openings from time to time. So you can message us through Delgado Entertainment Law. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. So let's take a little break so I can just take a, a quick swig of my tea and we'll be back in one minute. Hi, guys. I'm Miss Crystal, the author of How to Keep Your Dukes Up in the Music Business. Now, there are a lot of books on the market claiming to help you with your music career. But the reason why my book is different is because I am an entertainment attorney and I help my clients to make hundreds of thousands of dollars with their music careers by giving them the contracts they need to stay legally protected, by teaching them about copyrights and trademarks. Now, in my book, rated five stars on Amazon, I'm gonna give you a crash course on setting up a real life business for your music career, teaching you about marketing, music monetization, copyrights, and trademarks. And in addition to all of that, I'm giving you eight essential contracts that you need in order to stay legally protected. Click the link down below to learn more. All right, so let's jump now into our newsy segment. I'm going to bring that Orco back into the mix. Hello, hello. Hey, shout out to the community. Welcome everybody in. Please, if you are not subscribed to Top Music Attorney on YouTube, do so now. That is the main place where we broadcast on. Um, I kind of was letting you guys know last week, pretty soon we're going to stop broadcasting to Facebook altogether. Um, this is just kind of give you guys a preview of what's going on on the Top Music Attorney YouTube channel, which we're releasing content daily. I mean, how many pieces of content? Are, are, the content that's being released right now on Top Music Attorney is just like outstanding. How many pieces of content do you think we're releasing right now? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely do a, doing like a couple of videos a day. And we have a lot of variety, right? I mean, you know, the purpose of the different segments is to give you guys updates on newsy things, but then interlace a piece of learning, right? So learn how to not get fired by Evanescence, which is going right. to be our first segment. That, those kind of things. And also the rule, you have a lot of fun shorts on there and quick tips. So I just really recommend everyone just head over to Top Music Attorney on YouTube for sure. All right. So our first segment of the day. So um, 
ex Evanescence guitarist Jen, and I think it's Majura. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Jen Majura, Majura, Majura. She opened up about getting fired from the band in an interview, and she says, "I'm yes. still in shock." Now we covered this when it first kind of came out because Evanescence had posted. Um, online and just said, you know, we wish her all the best. We're going different directions. And so it seemed <laughs> like it was a mutual decision and that it was amicable. And then our thought on it based on Jen's tweet was, no, it sounds like she got fired. Mm -hmm. Well, Jen's now confirmed that in an interview that uh, she did recently. So let's talk about it. No, that that that's yeah. No, we 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 called it. I mean, I mean, she she said it too. But um, just how when they release when bands release these press releases, just everything is fine. Everything is fine. Which I don't know why they do that anymore. This isn't the days of like you know before the internet and Facebook and social media, where information doesn't travel so fast or everybody doesn't have a voice. So I mean, to release a statement saying, "Oh no, everything is cool," and if it wasn't cool. I mean, she's going to say something. She has social media. I mean, and she took to it immediately. But um, yeah, no, I think it's just pretty funny. That I, I love I love the Oh, no, it's great. It's great. But something wasn't great because she's not on tour. <laughs> she's she's not collecting tonight. <laughs> yeah. And Jen talked about that in the interview. She goes, I, you know, when I got the news, I was picking up my apartment. And then, um, you know, I kind of just ended up laying on the floor after I got the call. She goes, I thought this was a bad joke. Right. And then when it started to sink in, I remember just kind of turned my head and I was looking at my suitcase because, uh, you know, she was literally like planning oh. to be on tour in two weeks. And that tour, which started in June for Evanescence, right. would have taken her through the end of the year so basically like you know the next six months of her lives just just changed in a split second for sure like that's that that hurts her bottom line i mean she you know she was buying new guitars <laughs> and then she's like oh gotta put that one right back i don't know it's it's no it's no good but um i haven't really seen a reason yet though why like she's been um fired now if anybody is following um, the story and stuff, and they happen to have some insight. I mean, I don't follow Jen on, you know, Twitter or anything like that. So I don't know if something else has been released about why. I don't know if it was a money dispute, if it was a personality conflict. I'm sure eventually that'll come out because, I mean, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Evanescence is a major band. Um, and they are, you know, just kind of going on tour right now and killing it. And, you know, Amy Lee is back in full effect. We've covered Amy Lee on this channel. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for Evanescence, but I mean, I mean, maybe it's none of our business, but I mean, it's out there. What are we doing? Well, and you guys know, I'm a big fan of Evanescence. I love Amy Lee, but we're here to just report the news. And, and so from Jen's own words, she had just said, um, you know, when asked, well, are you going to join another band? She said, I actually have already received offers, f you know, from other bands, but she goes, I just really want to focus on me right now. And it almost sounded like she's trying to find her identity, which I totally get right. When your identity for six years is you are, you know, the lead guitarist for Evanescence as a female, you know, front leading kind of woman doing backup vocals with Amy Lee. I mean, of course, that's going to become very a big part of your identity. So she goes, I'm kind of focusing on me and she is going to be releasing her third solo album, which I think will be kind of cool. That's fun. I mean, but if I could, if I can speculate, if I can speculate, that's a fun thing just to kind of test the waters to see if there's any interest in her third solo album. I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure she has her fans and stuff like that, but I think she'll probably join another band. I mean, I th that, that paycheck that you get from touring as a musician, that's your, that's it. That's, that's, you know what I mean? Especially if you're not, you know, necessarily writing the songs and stuff like that, and you're not getting placements. Um, she's she's gonna want that that money. I saw somebody that said, uh, "Wasn't Evanescence album ten plus years ago?" No, they just had that Bitter Truth album just released last year. Um, they had Synthesis well, they had in, in like 2017 now. and uh, right. Lost Whispers in um, 2016. So, no, I mean they're 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 doing it, man. They're they're doing it real big. So. Yeah, and I feel like uh, they I'm really curious. are trying to come back. I know that they were kind of doing this tour with the orchestral interpretation mm -hmm. of their big hits, and I feel like they're kind of getting back to the basics now, which I'm sure yeah. fans are absolutely loving. Um, you know, so obviously, best of luck to everyone, but, you know, as far as like representing and working with a lot of artists and musicians um, through my law office, I mean, I definitely feel for Jen, and, you know, what's great is that she obviously has built a large platform because of her association with Evanescence. Right. And it was kind of fun because she shared a little bit about like how it all worked out. And she goes, um, 
I got an email and the email was like, hey, you, you know, are you interested in joining Evanescence? And she's like, I just melted. I didn't know what happened. And literally several days later, they flew me out to meet Amy Lee. And I was like, do you want me to audition for you? And Amy's like, right. oh, I've seen you. You know, I've seen a ton of videos. I know you are a seasoned performer. So they just like talked and had dinner. And so, you know, what an amazing experience. And it sounds like possibly, you know, management didn't do the, uh, the firing, you know, but it never feels good. It's never going to be great. <laughs> no, but I mean, I just thought I was, as you were talking, I was just like thinking of the other reality of it. You know, you're, you're saying, talking about all these good times that, you know, Jen had. And that's the other reason why I think she'll just end up joining a band. How many guitar players really have broken off from a band and went solo and been successful? I mean, I can think of a few, um, you know, yeah, like a John Five, not, John Frusciante. No, but what I'm saying is it's a big difference when you're playing on your solo tour at a club on Tuesday night at, you know, nine o'clock for 150 people as opposed to playing with Evanescence. And you know what I mean? And, and you, and you kind of crave that kind of, the, the you know, and, and funding the bill yourself and not just being a paid hand that gets to go in the nice buses, to go on the nice tours and stuff like that. Her budget's going to be a whole lot. Her lifestyle's completely changed. It's completely changed from her, her touring experience from being, you know, a solo artist as a guitar player. That's, you know, not an original guitar player. That's a filling guitar player. Um, you know, and that's, I'm just saying the reality of the music business. I know so many artists that are in other major bands and you know what I mean? And, and that, and being a hired gun is kind of, you know, the, um, is the bread and butter. That's where you, that's where you make your money. It's very hard. Cause you know, a lot of the hired guns that I know that, um, all try to make it on the solo bands and it's very difficult. It's a very difficult thing to do. And, you know, that was something, a decision that I, even I made. I chose not to go the hired gun route and I tried to do it on my own uh, with my rock band. And it wasn't as, as successful as I would have liked it to have been, but we got to do some stuff. But, um, yeah, no, I yeah, mean, well, it's... with my project, you know, obviously just I, I, being the lead singer, but then, you know, I gives me a little freedom. I could still play mm -hmm. my piano or my cello and kind of do those You're the things. Brand. I think. I think, you know, unfortunately for some of the other members in bands, you know, the front person, the lead singer is very prominently part of the brand, the image, you know, but nonetheless, um, I, in this particular situation, we definitely wish Jen the best of luck and, you know, we'll continue to cover it as updates come. I see Philly Sean in the con uh, in the comments talking about Dave Mustaine from Megadeth. Yeah, I hear you. Um, yeah. I mean, but then we're, what are we talking here? Like 30 years ago and, um, you know, George Lynch that, I mean, Again, um, I'm into it though. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it's a very difficult road. Yep. All right, moving on. So Ed Sheeran awarded 1.1 million in legal costs <laughs> after winning the Shape of You plagiarism lawsuit. All right, so guys, so so let me just give you kind of the the recap here. So there was a lawsuit, and they concluded a trial. It was like an 11 day trial. And this was in April. And so what happens is that after there is an award, so in which case the court said there was no copyright infringement, no plagiarism, then, you know, the parties have to deal with the attorney's fees issue. So what um, the, the losing side, right, the plaintiffs ask, they go, hey, we want defendants to have to pay their own attorney's fees. We don't want to get stuck with the attorney's fees. And the court uh, recently announced, no. You, you know, unfortunately, everyone, uh, or not everyone, plaintiffs have to bear the cost of defendants' attorney's fees in the amount of $1.1 million. Guys, we talk about this with these copyright cases, and I'm always like, yes, you can sue. Yes, you can seek a copyright infringement, you know, uh, resolution, you know, through a court of law. But if you lose, you might get stuck with the other side's fees, and mm. these are not, you know, inexpensive lawsuits. No, not especially with that. Not, not when you're dealing with this much money that's on the table, for sure. I mean, this isn't this isn't some Judge Judy case. Of course, you don't get lawyers there, so <laughs> don't don't be shading on Judge Judy. I love Judge Judy. You know, I'll watch Judge Judy when I'm working out. When I'm on that treadmill, I'll put that Judge Judy right on. That's right. Now she's she's amazing. She wasn't she like one of the most highly paid uh yeah uh, like reality show yeah, yeah ever crazy. <laughs> No, she's doing good. But in any case, all right. So, so Sharon and his two co-writers. So there's Steve uh, McCut McCutnion and Johnny McDade, and so they were all kind of lopped into this legal battle. And so what was interesting was that as part of the, of of the plaintiffs' claim to say no, 
you know, Ed Sheeran and the co-writers, they need to bear their own attorney's fees. Um, it's because two things. Number one, they did not participate in pre-litigation resolution, right? Which would be things like, hey, we sent them a demand letter, pay us money. And so either they just, you know, didn't respond or they didn't participate well enough. So that was part one of the claim. And then part two uh, was that, you know, apparently there were some like voice memos, you know, when they were making the song that weren't disclosed. So some alleged discovery issues. But, you know, the judge just said that's that's absolutely not enough for me to basically have them cover a million dollars in attorney's fees when you lost. What do you do when you are sending out, you know, either demand letters or, you know, things to different attorneys and they just either they just don't respond to you because <laughs> it's or does that or does that not happen or do do attorneys just kind of have a professional courtesy with each other where they know um right. you know they know they have to do it yeah good question um so uh most commonly i do get especially when i'm communicating with actual attorneys right um we get responses we comply with deadlines that are set by each side so having an attorney is actually a good thing right sometimes clients will be a little nervous because they get a letter and it's from an attorney it can be a good thing because it means you have hopefully a sense of professionalism on the other side of the dispute um it's a little more wonky when people are not represented but <laughs> oftentimes and even if it's you know a non-represented party i do get a response but i mean to answer your question what happens is that if we don't get a response then that's it we said in the letter mm. if we don't get a response by this deadline we will proceed with the lawsuit so then we proceed with the lawsuit and quite frankly it goes back to the attorney's fees thing so if we file the lawsuit and now we've incurred thousands of more dollars right. and then they say oh actually i want to settle Okay, great. But unfortunately, you have to reimburse all those right. additional fees for you just deciding <laughs> not to respond. You get attacked on. Yeah, no, so, that's... so not not respond at your own risk. No, that's just, I mean, but that's probably the thing. I mean, There's probably a lot of reasons, too, why lawyers don't respond. Because, you know, you know, they're not responding because it's maybe it's a flex. They're not responding because they just don't take you seriously. I don't mean you. I mean just the opposing counsel. Or, you know, attorneys are just people, too. And maybe they're just lazy. They did see it. You know what I mean? It could be something well, silly. Let me give you the other side of this, right? So um, you might have bigger companies like Warner or Universal where you'll send a demand and they get so many demand letters and, right. and they're ingesting so much that they, uh, number one, can't get to it. Or YouTube, right? Let's sue YouTube. So we send them a demand letter. They're not going to respond to you. So it's either they can't because they just can't get through it or you are a small fry and they're not going to do shit until they actually are sued because they just don't have capacity to respond to everyone. So, you know, a part of our tactic is just to look at, you know, who are we reaching out to and, and strategizing accordingly. My, my final comment, I guess, on the thing would be just like, can you imagine like what the, the legal team for a record label or for YouTube, like how many people it would be like if because you, you just you just blew my mind. Just I'm just thinking of just like all the people that are just submitting claims about things because, you know, they're just some kid in their bedroom that thinks that Ed Sheeran stole his song for some reason. And just I don't know, just or YouTube, just what just the sheer volume is what I mean. And just how many people and would they have like, you know, underlings kind of take care of and just kind of like it goes through like assist i can't even imagine how many you know just different things they might get in a given day you know um as part of ed sheeran's case i guess one of the things that he said um after the fact he had just said look you know i i people come after me but like i'm a songwriter i'm a husband i'm a father and just kind of think about the fact that there's only so many ways to write pop songs there's only so mm -hmm. many chords there's only so many melodies mm -hmm. and he goes it's really tough when you have these cases and and you know let's say plaintiffs are successful when they're just like oh that melody kind of sounds like mine right and there really was not necessarily plagiarism but the court finds you know for the plaintiff but anyway so what he was saying is if Spotify is ingesting 60,000 pop songs a day. It's you know, it's, it's, it's insanity to think that, okay, I heard your song and I ripped off your song or that there's not a ton of overlap in melodies in chord structures in lyrics. It's, do you it's think, do you think that copyright raw law is going to have to change? Like, you know, I mean, it's constantly evolving and it's constantly moving. Um, but like, you know, to a significant change where they're like, bro, like, you like they pretty much got to steal your song before we're gonna do anything because there's not a lot of options and at the end of the day if so, i don't know at the end of the day if somebody kind of samples something or if something 
is kind of taken, you know, I, I have something that I want to talk about later in my new music segment. I don't know. I guess it's hurting. It, it's hurting the, the original artists because they're not whatever. And somebody's taking their idea. But at the same time, it's like it's up to the audience to decide if something is kind of good or not and whether they're going to spend money. I don't know. Maybe there's they just got to figure out a way to do it because some of the stuff, it, I don't know, is it really that big of a deal? It is. It is. It is. But like, I don't know. I, what I feel, what I feel they're looking at right now is the stuff that people way- bring. Like the Mariah Carey thing. Like the stuff that no, I think playing. everyone everyone should have a right to have their claim heard. If they think that someone else ripped off oh. their song, of course they should have a right. However, what they're looking at right now is creating a small claims process so that you don't have to go hire an attorney and spend $150,000 on attorney's fees in order to get to some kind of resolution that there would be some kind of cheaper, faster process that people can can go through. I think everyone's entitled to kind of you know pursue their claim, oh, but sure. there's an efficiency and expense prohibition so yeah no i definitely don't have anything um i'm not i'm not i'm not i'm not saying that nobody does i'm just saying that like there's gonna be a point in 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 life where i just feel like all the ideas are gonna be kind of i don't know i just just some of the cases that i do see be brought forward um are just kind of i don't know like it's just i don't know there's some of them are kind of silly to me all right, so before we move on to our next segment, Harley, check out the Elvis movie that came out today if you want to see gross abusive management. I'm interested I, in that. I can imagine. I'm interested in that. That's like what? Like Tom Hanks? Uh, I heard I heard it's pretty good. That's like that Boz Lerman, the guy that did uh, Romeo and Juliet and Moulin Rouge and like all that stuff. I like, I like that guy's movies. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Suge Knight wrongful death case ends in a mistrial. So this case stems from the incident in 2015, and this is when they were making uh, Straight Outta Compton. And so there were two individuals that got into an altercation with Suge Knight, and so it was Terry Carter and Clay Bone Sloan. And so I guess in response to the uh, altercation, Suge Knight got into his truck, ran them Mm -hmm. over, and ended up killing Carter. So you know, then, there's that footage too. That was they had they got they had it on tape. They had the security footage. That like I remember when that happened, you could watch it happen. It was crazy. Well, and so what ended up happening is that we've had a couple of legal proceedings. Obviously, on the criminal side, there was prosecution and um, a verdict. And Suge Knight is you know now serving a 28 year sentence, I believe, in prison. So that's 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 kind of one vertical of what ended up happening as a result of voluntary manslaughter. Mm. So the one thing with voluntary manslaughter is that you know we're talking about manslaughter, so meaning that there had been an element of provocation, right? So there had been some kind of issue. I don't know, obviously, what the guys did, but uh, of course, in response to words being spoken or fists or things like that, you don't mm. run someone over. Mm. Um, but in any case, so then we had now <laughs> he a stepped sniffle. on that gas. He stepped on that gas. It's not funny, but like, like, like just, oh my God, on a movie set, he was on the movie set. Well, and of all the things that people have claimed that he has done in the criminal realm, like this is the thing that got him thrown got him. in yeah. prison. But in any case, um, so there was a civil trial. So let's talk about that. So um, that civil trial uh, recently concluded and um, unfortunately, we had like what's the equivalent of a hung jury. So let me go actually right back to. All right. So the this was the equivalent of a mistrial. And the reason why this is kind of interesting and it stood out to me is because the judge ruled that because only five of the seven jurors had, uh, you know, ruled in a certain way mm-hmm. um, that it was a mistrial and they needed a unanimous vote. Okay, and that's not normal for um, most civil cases. Now, I'm not a practitioner in California, but it seemed to be that there was almost this heightened standard, and it was similar to like a criminal trial, right? So, in criminal um, cases, you know, we have to have a unanimous verdict from the jury. So, you know, that was a little surprising just because we only had five out of the seven. And so now it's a mistrial, which means they have to essentially start over. That's pretty close. That's a pretty close. Well, and that's what his daughters said afterwards. And they go, we were at least happy to know that the majority of everyone was kind of, you know, on our side. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's pretty crazy. Like it's, uh, 
It's pretty crazy. And no, and that was when we first were discussing what kind of stories we were, you know, talking about. That's what I asked you. I was like, oh, are you, you know, is that is that usual to have something like that? I mean, if it's not a criminal case, if it's not like a, a criminal murder case, like why does it have to be a unanimous decision or why does there even need to be a jury? Yeah, it's so like in criminal cases, you know, you'll have a clear and convincing standard, um, but it also comes down to state rules, right? So, for example, we covered the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. And in that case, and pursuant to Virginia uh, rules, they had to have a unanimous decision, right? Mm. And so that was a little bit odd. So we don't typically see that. Um, I think Oliver even had a question about this. So Oliver on YouTube, how can they not meet the standard in civil court when it's criminal court? Uh, he was found guilty beyond all reasonable uh, guilt. Well, you know, we have kind of two separate proceedings, right? So in the civil, we have the family, the estate bringing this. And I think I, I, I when I was talking about the daughters kind of giving a quote, I was talking about the daughters of Terry Carter. They were ones that said, you know, we were glad that obviously the majority of the jurors were on our side for our dad. Um, but in any case, it really just comes down. But it was still to pretty split. split difference. Five out of seven. That's pretty split. That's pretty. I mean, that's pretty like, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, it's just when you know, it's tough when you just kind of know the legend that is Suge Knight. And then, you know, coupled with just like, just seeing like, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it seems more like in his, you know, easier for him just to get out of the car and maybe just punch somebody if it's that serious. Like he really took it up a notch. <laughs> This isn't just, yeah, I, guess, I mean, vanilla ice getting hung outside of a, of a, of a window, you know, or the balcony. Well, and then I, I guess, so he pled no contest to the criminal charges. And so no contest is basically admitting, or I'm sorry, not admitting any kind of guilt, but saying that the prosecutor likely has enough evidence, you know, to result in a conviction. So he did take a plea deal. And with that plea deal came the 28 year sentence. Um, and then the kind of the, the last piece of this that I was curious about was we covered recently the fact that um, Snoop Dogg had purchased Death Row Records, right? And so being a co-founder of Death Row Records, my question was, you know, did Suge Knight still have any interest or ownership in Death Row, right? Did he get to participate in um, that purchase? Because, you know, just because you're in jail, you still get to receive the benefit of your assets, right? With an exception, obviously, it can't be like, you can't write a book about, you know, murdering someone and then get paid for that. that that's not going to fly. But as it relates to his ownership in Death Row Records, and what I found, I have to confirm this, but what I found right before the show was, I guess there was a judgment against Suge Knight for over $100 million. And so there was a receiver appointed. And so kind of processing his, you know, assets, which included his ownership share in Death Row Records. So he lost, he basically lost it. Oh, man. Yeah, no, that, 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 that guy is trouble. Trouble. All right, so let me pull up this last article that I want to touch on. All right, so Billie Eilish is experiencing imposter syndrome. And this she, is interesting. <laughs> she opened up about this and she goes, anytime in the last year I've headlined a festival, I felt like, why would you choose me? And so imposter syndrome is um, a psychiatric condition or what, you know, is referred to as just kind of feeling like you are pretending, even if you are that thing, right? So if someone becomes a doctor, maybe they're early in their career and they might feel like they're an imposter for whatever reason. And I guess I kind of looked into this condition a little bit. And I even think this is probably something that I've kind of dealt with at times. We probably all have dealt with at times. But, you know, we have a tendency to kind of compare ourselves to other people. And to try to find, is there someone else who has done that thing, right? And how can I emulate myself after them? So, you know, for example, if you're Billie Eilish and you've taken over the planet and you wear big baggy clothes or you are just kind of like, you know, the oddball out, there's not a lot of artists like her. And so she, mm. she you know, she kind of talked about like, well, you know, when girls or female, you know, pop stars do shows, they have choreography and backup dancers and big lights and so, you know, I'm not that. And she even went on to be like, you know, it's almost unfair because like guys can get on stage and do basically nothing. <laughs> and, you know, and that's okay. And there's plenty of guys that get on stage and do nothing. There's nothing I dislike more than going to a show and watching a band or an artist just stand there. <laughs> like, it's terrible. I've seen Billie Eilish shows. 
like she goes off. She is, you know, one hell of a performer. Um, you know, she always sounds great live. It's unfortunate when people um, have a hard time enjoying the moment, enjoying their success and not um, that still deal with things that we all deal. I mean, they're, we're all human. So you, we all deal with like, you know, self-esteem issues and just feeling like, you know, at times that maybe you're a fraud because you're not good enough. I know for myself, you know, when, when we're getting into the studio and maybe we're starting a new project, I'm so intimidated. Anytime I started any kind of new project, cause I'm like, ugh, like what if I can't write anything good? Like, and I'm calling myself a music producer and you know, you got to go through those steps. Um, but then, you know, you work through them and then you go, oh yeah, <laughs> like you write some songs. <laughs> so like, it's, yeah, and so it's, what, what therapists talk about as far as like how to overcome it is that you build up a little bit of resiliency, but just, you have to keep showing yourself and being like, instead of having that doubt in rotation in your brain, you say, no, no, no. Remember that last time I did this. And remember that other time I did this, these are all the reasons why I'm dope as shit as a music producer and I'm going to kill it. And so you kind of just change the narrative in your brain. Cause it's your brain lying to you basically. It's got to be tough being Billie Eilish because, you know, she is, you know, obviously an incredible artist, incredible talent. Her and her brother Phineas together are an incredible team. Um, it's got to be a weird thing when you become because not every artist gets super fans and then not even every artist gets the kind of super fans that want to be like them. Like, you know what I mean? Like. Um, to where they want to dress like them, where they want to take their style. Like Billie Eilish has created a whole generation of people dressing like Billie Eilish. You've never and seen so many green roots. I'm telling in you, people's it's, hair. <laughs> and it's got to be a weird thing when you're just going out, just kind of doing your thing, and then you know, and then everyone's just trying to like kind of, kind of do like you. You feel this. You don't necessarily want to be a role model, but then you end up getting it thrown on you and then you have all that pressure. And then if you want to dye your hair blonde or look differently and not wear something baggy, you're going to get crazy criticized for it when you're just trying to do the thing that, you know, made you get where she's like one of the biggest success stories in music coming from basically SoundCloud from her bedroom with her brother to being one of the right. most the biggest artists telling every record label, no, you no, I'm not working with any of the producers. This is how it's going to be, or it's not going to be. And and the record label bowing down to an artist that didn't have any cloud other than SoundCloud. Like you got to be kidding me. Like I, I, yeah, no. I so in actuality, she's doing just fine. But I thought that was a very human thing of her just to admit that. Um, very humble, and you know, as a 20 year old, young, incredibly super powerhouse taking over the planet. You know, she's doing great things, and hopefully, she can overcome any of these little doubts that she has that we all experience uh as we go along our journeys yeah no and and just she has a real responsibility i feel like that she does take with her fans with the messages and her songs and stuff like that so she's always struck me as a very honest person all right so um you have some new music friday releases we're going to discuss yeah, yeah, just a couple things. Um, I'll, I'll go through them kind of quickly. I know we're getting kind of long in the show, and I want to keep everybody up, but it's pretty exciting. Uh, Baby No Money has a new song with Diplo, and it's called Pogo. So now, good. This, <laughs> this, this song dropped yesterday. I'm going to pull up the, the music video from it again. I'm not going to play the audio from it, but just go to your streaming provider, and how do, how do we like it? Like, Yeah, like this. How do we like it? That, how do we do it normally? Oh, that's good. I don't know. Let's do that. No, it's that one. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to play a little bit of this video right here just so you can kind of see. Like, it's crazy. You got Baby No Money right there. You got Diplo in the mix. Now, this song is kind of interesting. That little part they just focused on. He kind of, um, it's not like a sample, but he does his own take on the Lady Gaga um, Love Game song. That the the disco stick something just down with a disco stick, and I and it's pretty interesting because I I didn't look up the song credits because I wondered if he had to pay her to use that line rhythm because it's not the same but it's the same he's definitely going for that love game vibe on it but I love their outfits his one his videos are so crazy um all the time they got a pogo stick and they are just you know doing different things with the pogo stick he's mixing up some. I don't know, was that cactus drug kind of thing? Got dip, it's so creepy. 
He's having a kale, he's having a kale salad. What are you talking kale about? Kale salad. He's mixing up his kale salad. They're doing some other kind of activities, brushing teeth with a pogo stick, playing golf, serving up spaghetti. It's a fun song. And aside from it being fun, it's just like the beat is just out of control. And it's it could be it could be one for him. It could be one for him. Um, so that came out. Um, let's see what else we got. Beyonce's Break My Soul has been um, I thought about covering this on Tuesday because it came out earlier in the week. It's not really a new music Friday, but, you know, I still wanted to make sure to feature it. Um, it's a it's a really cool song. And in this song, she it's a kind of like a, a samples of she samples um, Robin S's Show Me Love and Big Frida's um, Explode and uh, Explode and um it's pr- it's a good song. It's like a house jam. So it's very kind of like throwback. It's very it's very housey. It's definitely a, a dancey kind of song. I saw this funny TikTok and this girl, she's like crying. And she goes, I just broke up with my boyfriend. There's tears streaming down her face. And then she's like, but Beyonce's song just came out. And then she's, you know, dancing in the kitchen. No, I feel it's, like it's, it's a vibe. No, no, seriously. It's one of those because I was listening to it earlier. And I'm just kind of like, you just kind of. It's got a nice groove to it, and it's you know it's it's uh, produced uh, you know with the dream, and he also did single ladies, he did run the world and flawless, so he is no stranger to Beyonce hits, uh, yes. and then controversial rapper Azalea Banks um, made a statement in an interview. Uh, she's a she's a she's a rapper that that raps over like kind of like '90s house beats and like techno beats and stuff like that. Um, She's very cool, but she she's very reminiscent of like a Kanye West where she has so much talent, but she's very outspoken and controversial. And gets and she herself into her, some trouble. Gets herself in a lot of trouble constantly. But, but she's, she's very talented. So yeah. good. Um, but anyway, people, fans are doing mashups of Break My Soul and Azalea Banks song. And Azalea Banks took to the internet and was just like, stop doing these horrible mashups. Like, don't put me on this song. Like, you know what I mean? Kind of thing. Oh, like, not, not throwing shade, not throwing shade at Beyonce or anything like that, but people are going, they're putting her on her because it's, it's kind of like this. It's, it's Azalea Banks's sound is the sound. And so they're just, it's a natural thing. Like you could totally hear an Azalea Banks verse on um, the break my soul thing. So, I mean, it doesn't, but she doesn't like it. So she asked the fans to stop doing that, but I don't think they're going to listen. I will say, let's see what else almost done, but gorillas and thundercat cracker Island. They just uh, dropped that song today. And this song is so groovy. The baseline on it is so funky. It's so dancey. I love the gorillas. They are on tour um, right now in Europe, they're about to start in North America. Um, that one may require some travel. I really want to see the gorillas. I love the gorillas. I know. I know. Uh, do they wear? Do are are? Is it just the guys on the stage, or do they no, ever so, like come out in costume so, or masks? No. Or so they have. So some shows they they'll have like a the whole thing will be animated and they'll have like little three D animations of them on stage like you know like they had like a hologram show at one point but then they have the curtains and then they'll play behind the curtains or then they had a thing where they just play the screens of all the cartoons and stuff playing and then they're playing okay. in front of the stuff like that but you never know who's gonna come out and then we were speaking of Billie Eilish and you know uh, Damon from the Gorillas he was um, he appeared with Billie Eilish during Coachella and sang Feel Good Inc. Um, but yeah, but no, the highly recommend this Cracker Island song. Thundercat plays bass on good. it. He's a he's a phenomenal bassist and um, producer. Uh, just really, really, really dope. Highly recommend that Gorillas. Um, Giveon just released a new record and it is really good. I've only oh, I, can, I don't want to say it's really good because I, I only skimmed it. I'm not going to lie to you. I skimmed it. It's good. I know I'm going to be listening to it this weekend. I love his vocal tone. I love. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it can be good. He's he's an incredible um, his voice by itself. (laughs) I skimmed. I skimmed about 20 seconds of every song on that record. And it was vibe. His voice. on. I was like, this is right up my alley. And, you know, after the show, we've been playing music videos and different things that we have done together. My uh, Miss Crystal and myself. And so after the show, I thought because Giveon had an album come out, we did a cover of Heartbreak Anniversary. And so I'm going to play uh, our cover of Heartbreak Anniversary after the show. So make sure that you stay in tune for that. But shout out to Giveon. I'm looking forward to that this weekend. And then something I don't really cover tons of rock music. Um, 
but this band excites me and they just released a new record. Coheed and Cambria, Vaxis Act 2, A Window of the Waking Minds. Now, this is the second part of, I believe, a five-part series that's coming out. Um, I believe it was 80 minutes. Now, I love this band. They are very... Their albums, I think they have like one or two that aren't like themed or don't have some like story, but like everything kind of tells a story, this story of Coheed and Cambria. I'm going to be dead honest with you. I don't really care about the story. I never really bought into that whole thing. The albums and the songs are incredible. Um, The guitar work and, you know, when their singer Claudio is, if you've ever seen him live, him singing and playing guitar at the same time because he shreds. And, you know, these songs are really complicated. They're not like verse, chorus, verse songs. Like, they are a journey. Um, His vocal tone is incredible, but he is such an incredible player and singer. Like, it's an amazing thing to watch him do his thing. Um, But I'm really excited about this. I skimmed this record. It sounds pretty standard, Coheed and Cumbria. Um, I've been a fan for a long time, so I'm into listening to that this weekend. So it'll be a lot of Give On, a lot of Baby No Money. The Gorilla song I'll probably have in rotation and, you know, this Coheed and Cambria. And I saw somebody earlier in the chat mentioned the new Weezer record or Weezer. Weezer also dropped a Seasons record. It's also they're doing like a four or five EP release thing where they're doing each one of the seasons and um, they're doing a Broadway residency, which is pretty cool. So I, I saw that about Weezer today, another really cool band. Yeah, no, and as you guys, I love that we were seeing a few comments coming through as far as like um, new things that are happening in the entertainment business or whatever. If you guys are bringing also information here, we have so much that we cover, but we don't get everything. So if you have other things that are happening, please let us know. That's great. Yeah, and then also let's just touch on you know, pretty soon we are going to be doing live on air artist reviews. We'll get you on the screen. We'll take a listen to some of your music or watch one of your music videos. We'll take a look at your social media and answer your questions. You have a real life, amazing entertainment attorney here that can answer any questions that you have. And you guys will be able to help out other artists in the crowd. Yeah, I'm excited. And uh, we'll be sure to mention this earlier in the show next week. I want to make sure people actually um, are seeing this. But yes, live every Tuesday and Friday. All right, that Orko. Thank you very much for joining us for all the newsy things. Thanks for having me. And I'm out. All right, guys. So, yeah, we're going to run the Givion On cover that, that Orko and I did together, which actually I haven't watched this in a while. This is not available on... Um, digital streaming platforms you know it's literally only on youtube and it's been a minute since i took a look at this so i'm excited we actually have a new cover song i'm not gonna tell you which one but we just finished a new cover song and we'll be releasing that in a couple weeks which will be a little prelude to the original works that we're going to be releasing so i'm excited it's been way too long um since we've been kind of releasing new music so in the meantime if you want the updates and all the music things you can follow on top music attorney as well as uh the social medias right for top music attorney and miss crystal now for those of you who are watching on different platforms as always please be sure to come over to youtube on top music attorney and say hello so without further ado we're gonna go ahead and get into the um the Gibby on cover and just remember guys this is you know top music attorney podcast this is the place where we are teaching you how to master the entertainment business, learn how to stay legally protective. And we just had so much fun on this channel and uh, in the chat. So I appreciate all of you. I love your faces. Have a wonderful weekend. And that Orco, you can start that video whenever you're ready.
Hey guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to check out my music video, Sugar, from my album, Dangerous Daughters.